Should I shift now? Hmm. No, not yet. How about now? Hmm. No, not yet. Oh yeah, that was perfect. That was exactly where that shift needed to be. Or was it? How would I know? If only there was a way to figure out when you should shift for optimum acceleration. I wonder how we could figure that out. Science! Let's start with the absolute basics. Back to our old friend Newton, who discovered that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the applied external force and inversely proportional to the object's mass. But you're probably familiar with the more common F equals MA arrangement. Since we're interested in acceleration, we do simple algebra to rearrange the equation to solve for acceleration. In our case, we're trying to accelerate our car. So we need an external applied force, like somebody pushing the car. But cars somehow magically accelerate without invisible pixies pushing them. How? Let's talk about torque. Torque is twisting force created by a tangential linear force acting at a radial distance away from the center of rotation, so torque equals force times radius. But again, we're interested in the force to accelerate our car so we can rearrange the equation and solve for force. Going back to our car, we can now see that the torque from the driving wheels, rear wheel drive in this example, creates a tangential linear force pushing backwards on the ground. Yes, backwards. But our buddy Newton comes to the rescue again because he discovered that equal and opposite forces are created when objects, like our tire and road, interact. So, as weird as it is to think of, the ground is actually pushing your car forward to accelerate. No need for invisible pixies. Okay, still with me? So, we have the reaction force of the ground created from the wheel torque that pushes our car and generates our acceleration. And that force is equal to the wheel torque divided by the tire radius. So with a bit of algebra and substituting the second equation into the first, we can see how our acceleration is directly proportional to our wheel torque for a fixed mass and tire radius. This, of course, assumes we're not spinning the tires, but that's a whole other discussion. See my clutch signs video on that one. Now, we just need to understand how our wheel torque changes with engine RPM and transmission gearing. Let's start with understanding gearing. When a small gear turns a larger gear, there's a speed reduction of the larger gear. The speed reduction is technically the ratio of gear pitch diameters, but fortunately, it also corresponds to the ratio of the number of gear teeth. In this case, let's say we have two gears, one with 14 teeth, the other with 28 teeth. So in our example here, if the 14 tooth gear is spinning at 1000 RPM, the larger 28 tooth gear would spin at 14 divided by 28 equals a half of 1000 RPM or 500 RPM. But another really important thing happens. While the speed is reduced by the ratio of gear teeth, the torque transmitted is increased by the inverse ratio. This is of course simplified by ignoring frictional and parasitic losses. So if we have 500 foot-pounds at the 14 tooth gear, we'll see 28 divided by 14 equals 2 times 500 or 1,000 foot-pounds at the 28 tooth gear. This is why your car will accelerate quicker if you increase the gear ratio, like going from a 308 rear gear to a 456 gear will feel like you added 100 or more horsepower. Power. We've been talking about force and torque and relating that to accelerating your vehicle, but haven't once mentioned power yet. So you might think that doesn't matter, but oh yes it does. Power is defined as the rate of doing work, or work over time. Work is defined as moving a force through a distance. So combining the above, you get power equals force times distance divided by time. But let's go one step further and this will make more sense for our vehicle acceleration problem. If we look at the distance over time part of the equation, well, that's just velocity, right? Since velocity is defined as distance over time. 
So from the previous, we can now see that power equals force times velocity. And if we go back to where it all started, force equals mass times acceleration. Now, knowing power equals force times velocity, we can get power equals mass times acceleration times velocity. And rearranging for what we're really interested in, we can get acceleration equals power over mass times velocity. Now, one other little bit of math to make things sound more familiar before we interpret this. Weight equals mass times acceleration due to gravity, or mass equals weight over g. So from our previous calculation for acceleration and our equation for weight, we can get that acceleration equals our gravitational acceleration times power divided by our velocity times our weight. This is key for a couple of reasons. First, you'll notice the power divided by weight. This is the infamous power to weight ratio. So more power and less weight calculates to more acceleration. Secondly, notice the velocity in the denominator. That means for a given amount of power in vehicle weight, the faster you go, the less you can accelerate. That's why power is always more important than just torque. You can easily make more torque by adding more gearing, as we've shown, but because gearing divides the speed by the same ratio as it multiplies the torque, you can't make more power through gearing. So to maintain acceleration with increasing speed, you need to pour on more power. And this is exactly what the big power, top fuel, pro mod, no prep, drag radial, etc. Uh, cars do with power and clutch management. Okay, went off on a tangent there about the importance of power. Back on topic about determining optimum shift points. Oh, one other really important thing. We're really simplifying the math here for illustrative purposes. We're not including frictional losses, inertia effects, aerodynamics, etc. This is just the foundational physics. Now, let's go back to accelerating our vehicle. Torque at the drive wheels ultimately gives us our acceleration capability. The torque at the drive wheels is equal to the torque at the engine times the gear ratio of the final drive, the rear gears, times the active gear ratio of the transmission, times the torque ratio of the torque converter, if you have an automatic trans, um, or in summary, this. Drive wheel torque is engine torque times final drive gear ratio times transmission gear ratio times torque ratio of the torque converter, if you have one. For a manual trans, the torque ratio of the clutch is one. Well, hopefully. So then we only need to worry about the transmission and rear end gear ratios. And again, this is a simplification because we're not including driveline inefficiencies or inertia effects. Okay. So to go further, we now need some information for your car. If we have engine dyno info, that gives us engine torque versus engine speed. And we can use the prior math to determine torque at the drive wheels. Or if we have chassis dyno info, then you might think we have actual drive wheel torque, but we don't. A loaded chassis dyno measures the torque at the drive wheels, then uses that along with the wheel speed to calculate wheel power. An inertia chassis dyno measures the acceleration of the dyno drum and, knowing its inertia, calculates the applied drive wheel torque. In both cases, though, the dyno torque reported is calculated by taking that wheel power and then using engine RPM to calculate a quasi-engine torque value. So it's not true engine torque and not actual wheel torque either. It's almost meaningless, but we can still use it for our purposes here, and it can actually save us a step to determine our optimum shift points. First, let's start with engine dyno info like I have for my GTO. What we ultimately need is a graph of drive wheel torque versus vehicle speed for all transmission gears. How we get there involves some spreadsheets and some of the simple math that we've already covered. Let's start with the engine dyno data. Get a data file from the dyno if you can that can be imported into a common spreadsheet program. 
Here, we'll start with engine torque versus engine RPM. Then we can eliminate all columns to the right of the torque data. For my GTO, it's a manual trans with only four speeds, and fourth gear corresponds to a one-to-one -one ratio. To calculate vehicle speed from engine speed, we need to do a bit of math again. So you can simplify the three numbers in the equation here to just 1,056 in the denominator, but I like to leave the raw numbers as a check for my calculations. The 12 is for inches to feet, 60 is minutes to hours, and 5280 is feet to miles. So that's where all those numbers come from. The GTO has 28 inch tall tires and 373 rear gears. So with that info, we can add another column to our spreadsheet for vehicle speed in fourth gear. Next, we need the drive wheel torque in fourth gear. Since fourth gear is a one-to-one -one ratio and we have a clutch, we only need to multiply the engine torque by the final drive ratio, which for my car is 373 to one. So we add another column where we take all column B values and multiply by 373. Next, we can add in the speed and torque columns for third, second, and first gears using the previous formulas to fill out our spreadsheet. Now, if you had chassis dyno data where you've got torque versus engine speed, it's even easier. If you dynoed the car in a one-to-one -one high gear ratio, and why wouldn't you, you can easily calculate the speeds and drive wheel torques for the other gears by simple multiplication or division of the high gear torque and speed, respectively. For my Mustang, I have chassis dyno data for runs made in fifth gear, which is a one-to-one -one ratio in my race transmission. So, for example, generating fourth gear data is just dividing speed by the fourth gear ratio of 1.34 and multiplying dyno torque by 1.34. Back to our GTO data. The next step gets uglier. We need to plot each gear torque curve versus vehicle speed. There is a way to do this automatically in the spreadsheet, but it's a crazy ugly formula. Often it's just easier to fill out a column for each vehicle speed from the minimum speed in first gear to the maximum speed in high gear, then look up the corresponding torque value for each gear. Continue to correlate the torque in each gear to the mile per hour until you have the full speed range of data. Once you have that filled out, then create a graph showing the drive wheel torque in each gear versus vehicle speed. Now, you might say, wait, we're interested in acceleration. True, but with our simplified math, acceleration is directly dependent on wheel torque, so we don't actually have to do that last mathematical step, but you can if you want. So, what do we do with this graph? How do we interpret these results? Let's compare the wheel torque in first gear versus second gear. You can see how there's more wheel torque throughout the entire engine RPM range in first gear compared to second gear. So if the question is, when should you shift out of first gear and into second gear to maximize acceleration? The answer in this case is right at the absolute top of the RPM range in first gear. In our GTO example, I don't think I have the valve train stability to exceed 5,800 RPM. So that's where I would shift out of first gear. Note that even though the wheel torque in first gear is dropping sharply at the top of first gear, if I could rev the engine higher and stay in first gear longer, we can project that I would still maintain a higher wheel torque in first gear and thus greater vehicle acceleration than if I shifted into second earlier. The same effect happens on the two three shift and although to a lesser extent on the three four shift too. For all gears, maximum acceleration happens if you hold each gear to the engine's redline RPM before shifting. But that's not always the case. If we look at my five-speed Mustang, for example, you'll notice the wheel torque curves cross between third and fourth gear. So in that case, the ideal shift point corresponds to that intersection point. If we stayed in third gear all the way to the engine redline, the drive wheel torque in third gear would actually fall below the drive wheel torque in fourth gear and acceleration would suffer. So how do we find that magic third gear shift RPM? We 
backtrack from the vehicle speed to where the wheel torque curves intersect. And for our example, that's around 72 miles per hour. Going back into the spreadsheet data, we can see exactly where third gear wheel torque falls below that of fourth gear. And from the data, it's between 72 and 73 miles an hour. From that, we can back calculate the exact engine RPM from our equation or just look back in our spreadsheet and see what engine RPM corresponds to about 72 and a half mile an hour in third gear. And the winner looks to be 6,125 RPM. But what if you hate doing math? Is there another way? Well, yes, you could try to use a data logger. If you have a data logger with an accelerometer, like my race pack, for example, you can generate the actual acceleration curves in each gear. So instead of plotting drive wheel torque curves for each gear, you could plot actual acceleration curves and see if and where they might cross. But if that's still too much work for you, for a quick sanity check on your shift points, you can simply compare the acceleration rate before and after a gear change to make sure the acceleration after the gear change is less than before. If it's not, your curves are crossing and you should try shifting earlier. So to summarize, for maximum acceleration, if your wheel torque curves don't intersect, you want to shift at maximum engine RPM in each gear. If you have wheel torque curves that do intersect, you want the shift at the engine RPM corresponding to the vehicle speed where the curves intersect. But wait, you see, you forgot to talk about optimum shift points for automatic transmissions. Yeah, well, that's a lot more complicated because you need to know the behavior of the torque converter at all RPMs and loads. That's a whole other discussion that maybe I'll get into at some point in the future. But for now, we'll leave it here. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned something. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. As usual, stay safe, be kind, and be humble. We'll see you next time.